Living Adventurously is brought to you in partnership with Kamut, the route planning and navigation app that helps you make the most of your outdoor adventures. Whether you're cycling, hiking, running or bikepacking, Kamut's easy to use technology will get you out the door and exploring more of the great outdoors. You can see where I've been exploring by checking out the highlights of my journey on Kamut. Just follow the link in the show notes. My name is Alistair Humphreys. I set out on a bicycle journey around Yorkshire to speak to interesting, ordinary people who, in very different ways, are making an effort to live adventurously. I wanted to talk about what they do, about the barriers they've faced along the way, and to seek their perspective on some of the big questions that all of us encounter in our lives. Welcome to Living Adventurously. <laughs> I've written here, needs intro music. Um, okay, here we go. Um... <laughs> Have a loop. I first knew Tomo via email as a fountain of knowledge about adventure literature and the mountains and wild places of Britain. He is um, he's surprisingly well-read and thoughtful for an ex-member of the Parachute Regiment. Um, more recently, Tom and I spent a memorable night eating takeaway curry high in a clifftop cave and generally putting the world to rights. Today we met in the breezy Yorkshire sunshine, kicked off our shoes on a patch of city centre grass and chatted as we watched the world go by. I asked Tomo whether the word adventure is appropriate for an army career. Um, I got him to recommend a book to read and then finally borrowed from his massive stash of outdoor gear a, um, a fleece to keep me warm at night for the rest of the ride. Tomo, thank you very much for meeting me again. I think perhaps uh, the last time we had a good chat was in a cave. Oh, yeah. Do you remember that? I do. The, um, the um, curry in a cave extravaganza we yeah. yeah we our plan was to go camp in a cave um in the peak district and on the way out of town the the delicious smells of the takeaway just seemed far more appealing than a pot noodle didn't it it did yeah we came out of the railway station in hathersage i think we were in fact no we were going to go to the spa weren't we the yeah the little garage shop in hathersage and buy like i don't know you know some pot, noodles. Kind of pot noodles or something and then got the waft from the curry shop a curry house over the road and then walked a uh, there was three of us wasn't there we walked a, a curry for four or five of us up to up to Stanage Edge and into Robin Hood's cave which was all good it was fantastic so um when we met then you were working hard at your um sort of guiding people and getting young people out into the outdoors uh, you're still doing that uh, yep. but you're also now um working for friends of the peak district uh yeah it's what's that in. so friends of the peak district is a uh it's a part of um, a larger charity called the Campaign to Protect Rural England. Um, the, our branch of that charity, which is kind of better known, I guess, as Friends of the Peak District, was founded in 1924. And, and essentially, it's a, a charity that uses um, donations and, and a membership charity uses our funds to um, where we and our members see fit to challenge... Um, building and development work on the landscapes of the Peak District National Park and of South Yorkshire that we don't think are uh, sustainable or right or fit in with what should be doing at that time and that place. Okay, and this is, this is all quite a long way from your um, early days career um, of being in the army. Um, what, what... Well, actually, if you go all the way back, yeah. I, I was thinking the other week, actually, and we, we had that kind of career in a cave the other day, I think... It kind of all started in a, for me in a cave anyway when I left home in the northeast of England and I went and lived in Millican Dalton's cave in, um, in Borrowdale in the Lake District. The Professor but, of Adventure. The Professor of Adventure, um, indeed. And then, um, yeah. A so long how long did ago. you live in his cave for? Six, six months, I think, in the early 90s and then in the, around about the mid-90s, um, for some reason thought I'd better get a career. So I joined... Um, I joined the army and did all sorts of um, army-type stuff until 
So what, what uh, regiment did you go to join? Oh, uh, so I did some time in, uh, it's like snakes and ladders. I look at my career as a game of snakes and ladders. In the parachute regiment, some time in the, uh, quite a bit of time in the intelligence corps, a short period of time in the uh, Royal Army Medical Corps, and then, uh, and then I commissioned and went to Sandhurst, and then I joined the Royal Signals, and then did some uh, quite tangential stuff on the on the margins of the Royal Signals, uh, and yeah, left in summer '16 after 24 years, I think, and then. Three days later, I went. <laughs> I was asked to go back into the reserves to do a thing that I was doing at the time, and did another another year and a bit in the in the reserves. So, yeah, until earlier this year. Uh, sorry, summer of last year. Okay. So, but the 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 main thing I'm interested in through talking to people on this bike trip I'm doing now is the different ways people are going about trying to live adventurously. So, when you were in the army, what did living adventurously mean back then? Did you join it for an adventure? Uh, I think I did join it for an adventure because I um and I had stuff some great opportunities with the reserve, for, uh, what was then the territorial army beforehand, and ended up on kind of trips all over the place. And even when I'd lived in the Lake District before that, I didn't kind of realise that you could get kind of qualifications and stuff and and actually get paid to take people. And actually, one of the uh, really potent tools of leadership development in the in the army is is what they call adventurous training, what we call kind of outdoor pursuits. And um, yeah, I was quite lucky at a fairly junior rank to go and get some climbing and walking qualifications. And then um, I was able, obviously when you're a junior rank, it's quite quite difficult to get away on them, but I was able to do, you know, climbing, walking, paddling, trips, courses, expeditions, you know, all over the world, which is a, you know, um, at the, it's easy to say now at the taxpayer's expense, but, you know, I, I saw some, not, not only operationally with the military, but moreover in in um, some of those memories of being with groups of groups of um, kind of men and women in some far flung places. And then when I commissioned, it's kind of leadership role as well. And then actually beginning to understand, yeah, that that potency of of you know the developmental role of of, of challenge in the outdoors. Um, yeah, and was able to 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 do quite a few more trips, which was good. I remember when I was at um, at uni. And I was trying to figure out what direction I was going to go after uni. Um, I knew I wanted to have some sort of adventurous site. Well, I wanted to try and live a life with adventure in, but I wasn't quite sure how that would look. And I remember my first sort of bike trip, I cycled around Scotland for a few days. I was absolutely knackered. I'd never done anything like it in my life. Got completely soaked in my tent, <clears throat> cycling past the Commando Memorial at um, Spean Bridge. And I really remember this vividly, standing there looking at that memorial thinking, now, if I want an adventure, that is an adventure. Going to join the army and doing something properly mad feels like adventure. Um, but there's some downsides, I suppose, to the to the rip roaring adventure. There are, and there's a um, there's a book, isn't there? I can't remember the name. The the author um, the book's called The Junior Officers Reading Club. Oh yes, which, I've is, read that. which is a brilliant book about the the ninety nine ninety eight percent sheer boredomness of because clearly that you know the the mili- you know the as an organization the military can't be doing amazingly exciting adventurous things for everybody all of the time and there are very very long periods of boredom and all those kind of those those phrases of kind of hurry up and wait and sitting on your rucksack and you know and t- and there are times people shooting at you yeah there are times people shooting at you, you know you know does that uh, count as an adventure um it certainly sounds as a, a, a works as a kind of formative experience and um <laughs> you know times that you know in the balkans and iraq and afghanistan and you know, various other places that I went to that um, I, they're, that, that that's fundamentally, I, I, I think, though, when you put yourself in or are, or are put into um, experiences where risk is involved, you're, you then become perhaps more able to deal with the rest of the risks that kind of life throws at you. Uh, uh, and actually, clearly, Bit being shot at the, the, you know, if you take away the kinetic side of that, the the decision making and the response and how you're going to deal with risk, you can, you can get quite near to that, in you know in the mountains and you can get quite near to it on, you know, running white water or, or parachuting or climbing or doing a, a trek in you know somewhere really, you know hazardous, hazardous around the world. It, 
uh, and, and I, I, it was actually Chris Bonington and um, some of the um, earlier um, kind of adventurous climbers that were that were um, junior officers and senior NCAs in the British Army that you know actually properly kick-started the, the British Army using adventurous training as that rule. And it's quite simple, really, isn't it? That you know, instead, in, if you can get that development very, very close to those development. Um, Benefits by not actually shooting at people. Uh, I did hear, I did read once actually that the the um the Israeli the Israelis don't don't do a great deal of adventurous training because they they actually lie fire at near their soldiers in recruit training. So they don't you know they don't have to do adventurous training to get the same um, <laughs> experiential learning. They just use live rounds, which is which is absolutely not um not necessarily how it should be done. But. <laughs> um, and how do though the all the that spirit of living adventurously from your life in terms of the military or the expedition stuff. How did how did the um, the lessons from that transfer to your uh, more normal life now of uh, working a day job, but still trying to have that adventurous spirit? What 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 does that? How's that transferred into real life? I, I think it's um. What one thing military life gives you is a restlessness, um, and also a. I think you deal with. But uncertainty is more of a norm in military life, so I, I, um, I still get kind of really frustrated if, it sounds a bit odd, but if I kind of, if there's no uncertainty coming up in the, in the calendar, in the diary, if that, if that kind of makes sense. Um, I, I think also just, you know, lots and lots of people are, the vast majority of us are, are kind of confined to a nine to five job or something like that, but, you know, you can jump on your bicycle to and from work. And, and perhaps mix up the way you bicycle to and from the route that you take to and from work, or um, you know just go. And the the um, benefits of kind of headspace and open spaces. Just try and spend, even if it's even if it's open spaces in, in, in the urban environment, is is to do that. And then, like lots and lots of people, my my opportunity to take longer adventures is being, you know, is being decreased over the last couple of years. So you just you were you know we're back into. Um, Micro adventures and smaller adventures, where you just, um, you know, you you maximise what you can. I'm I'm lucky to live on the um, on the western side of Sheffield, so the national park is, you know, a couple of kilometres away. So, um, oftentimes to you know to, to to decompress from, you know, finance and HR and everything in the office is to just take a bicycle into the Peak District or some, you know, some running shoes or you know get the train into the into the heart of the national park and. You know, um, you know, bivvy overnight and come back in the next morning, or or whatever. Just, just you're very seldom now. You know, I was very lucky in the military to go away for kind of weeks and months at a time on adventure training expeditions. You can't do that when you've got <laughs> a proper life and a proper job. So you just have to do the best you can in smaller chunks. Do what you can with what you have, and do it now. There's a there's a there's a, there's a quote in there, isn't there? There is a quote in there. <laughs> so one of the things I've been doing. Uh, Trundling around Yorkshire, meeting all sorts of interesting people, uh, and you, is uh, uh, asking them these the, some questions from my uh, deck of playing cards. Oh wow! Uh, so interviewing by playing card. So I wondered if you'd mind answering a few of these. Um, so take a card from the top, give and give, um, give me your wisdom. Have these got questions on them? Yeah, we're not playing poker. Oh wow! Yeah. No, I've never seen these before. Well. Wow. Oh right, okay. Uh, if you don't want to answer, you can, you can ignore them. So the and question also because you're in the army. If, you, if there's any long words, I'm happy to help. <laughs> um, if you asked your childhood self who you thought you would be now, would you measure up? Uh, I think I would actually. I, um, one of the last things I did in the reserve army, I was very lucky to. Early last summer, so 2018, I spent five or six weeks in the Trudos Mountains of. Cyprus, um, leading leading walks and adventure training, various other things. And a couple of people back in the UK saw an advert for the chief executive of Friends of the Peak District, which I hadn't seen. But when three or four people send you a um, send you a job advert, my email and go, you know, you'd be great. It's a job this. for you. This would be. And I was like, really? Anyway, the, the stars really, really aligned. And you know, my I have the opportunity again um, as part of the job to to go out and try and actively work to protect. The landscapes of the, you know, the Peak District and, and South Yorkshire, which is being in open space, caring for open space, uh, and um, is something that, you know, is crikey. Until I was 
six or seven years old. I can remember, you know, being at Ashness Bridge in above Borrowdale in the Lake District before going home to the northeast and kind of looking across, you know, the, the Lake District National Park and thinking, this is just kind of really, really great and somewhere that, that I'd like to spend as much time as I can and work to work to protect. So I, I don't think... Um, yeah, I think my, my 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 childhood self looking at what I'm doing now would 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 be you know really kind of quite chuffed. Um, what three things would your younger self be proud of? Um, crikey! Uh, my military service, I think. Um, yeah, having having um, done my bit, as it were. Um, I think also the the base the military and, and in in civilian life the, the you know the places I've managed to get to and the and, and the you know the the fairly um active adventurous life that I've I hope I've lived I'm only whatever half three quarters of the way through it half of the way through it aren't I um what three things would your younger self be proud of I think that's good I think you've done you've probably my collection of original Patagonia catalogues. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good thing to have. Okay, next question. Oh, these are ace. Oh, good. Well, you've only done one. What small thing do you do regularly which greatly improves your life? Um, go to the top of a hill. Uh, from home, it's often the White Edge or Stanage or the top of Wynn Hill or somewhere on the Derwent Edge. Um, lost lad. Um, and sit down and turn the phone off and, you know, accept what the weather's doing, look out across the skies, realise both how big and how little you are in the, you know, in this planet and just, just, there is a headspace thing there, I think, but, but actually just, just inhaling open space and countryside and letting every, you know, things wash over you. Nice, that's a nice phrase, inhaling open space and countryside. Another one. Yeah. What advice can you give me so that I look back on my life with satisfaction rather than regrets? So I'd ask you this as a wise old man. A wise old man. Um, I think that just when when opportunities or or decisions, um, you know, present themselves, I, I was going to say don't make. Too, too hasty decision, but but just just you know just make a make a decision and and whether that's whether that's to do that thing or not to do that thing, but don't don't prevaricate and stew over stuff. Um, I think one of the things that military life um, makes you do certainly at the kinetic end of it is you have to do something. Okay, yes, you know, yeah, you yeah. know if you it if really you matter what, you know I'll, I'll be an analogist here, but if you you know or the Blackadder sketch, whatever it is, but if you stick your head above the trench and it gets blown off, or whatever, then then something's got to happen to stop, <laughs> you know, you can't stick any more heads above the trench. Some, something has got to, got to, um, and my, my experience is that the longer you, um, the longer you leave a decision, or the longer that you, um, you, you ponder and stress grows by thinking about something is just, just, you know, just get on and do it. And, and actually, if you've made the wrong one, um, the, 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 there's a there's a benefit in in um, in movement rather than inertia, isn't there? You'll you know you'll begin to move towards whatever it is that you want to do. Make, make uh, faith in yourself. M actually make decisions, and then um, you know when you jump off whatever board it is at the swimming pool, the water will eventually you know you'll eventually hit the water <laughs> rather than s standing there with your toes over the edge for what seems like hours, wondering what's going to happen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, a quick little uh, another one, another twi one. Twitter photo of your cards. Are you doing what you love? Uh, I think so. Um, yeah, I'm. You know, I'm. I'm very lucky as the as the chief executive for charity to to be paid to look after. Um, oh, just keep it. Yeah. To be paid to look after. Um, you know, the landscapes of South Yorkshire and the Peak District. You know, having the opportunity to do that and the depth and breadth of people that. That use those landscapes, that work in those landscapes, that care for those landscapes is really, really, um, you know, really, really great thing to be doing. But I also find the time um, to to get out into um, into open spaces, which is um, 
which is important. Uh, you, everybody has this this um, kind of great thing that they'd, or perhaps when they're younger, this great thing that they envision doing. But I think if you if you temper that rea with reality, living in a living on the edge of a great city, having having a job that allows me to be outside quite a lot, but then also having experience and qualifications to in my weekends and things to still do outdoor pursuits and outdoor learning with people is um, not too shabby. Nice. Good. Next. Another one? Yeah. <laughs> oh, wow. Two old men walking past us in matching chessboard sweaters, matching hessian bags and matching red baseball caps. There's a story there, isn't there? There is. Are they twins? I think they're I'm twins as well, I'm guessing they're twins, they? but they're That's... still dressed identical, aged 80. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> oh, man. They look like they should have a TV show or something. Yeah, they... um, how would your life be different if you were a millionaire? Um, without, I was gonna, it probably sounds quite flippant to say that I, I, I don't think it would, um, by which I mean I, I'm, not, I'm not that materialistic, I'm not that... Um, money orientated i try to give a reasonable amount of my income to you know causes and charities that i support i would see myself if i was genuinely honestly you know given you know given a million pounds i don't think i'd change my car i don't think i'd change the size of my flat um you know i don't think i'd probably change where i lived um i might actually spend you know slightly cliched but spend that money on you know securing my son's future and then give a very, very significant amount of it away. I, I'm at that point in life where I'm trying to... Um, um, I read a book, I um, can't remember the name of the author, but the, it's a, a Japanese um, essay, uh, which was turned into a book which is called Goodbye Things, and it's a fairly, um, it's fairly savvy sound argument for considering how much you own and you know how many of everything you own and actually what's your ability to keep hold of them um i think also you know as the as the chief executive of an environmental charity I, I try not to own or have or do too much of anything and try and minimize my my footprint generally i, I think there'd be quite a few um probably some um service welfare charities and some environmental charities that would um benefit considerably if i was given a million pounds to be honest yeah that's a good place to be i think cool next What book should I read to make myself more wild, bold, and curious? Uh... Yeah, you're a good source of books. You were the person who told me about uh, Millican Dalton in the first place. Oh, his, um, his little book is lovely, isn't it? The Professor of Adventure book. Um, um, I was going to say, but the question asked me only... Um, you can one, make up whatever you want. One book. I'm, I'm going to say anything that um, Tristan Gooley has written. Oh yeah, um, but the book, natural, that, the Natural Navigator, the book that I recommend to almost everybody, and, and, and everybody that I do that I'm lucky enough to kind of work and play with outdoors. Um, Tristan was was um, asked by the School of Life uh, in London quite a long time ago to to write a very small book to kind of um, you know to to introduce people into the outdoor environment, natural environment, and perhaps change their perspective on it. And he wrote a very very small. I I, I consider it. Um, Sometimes I, I, I define how long it takes to read a book by how many visits to the toilet you require to get to the end of it. And a, a small green book available from the School of Life called How to Connect with Nature by Tristan Gooley is probably, you know, two or three visits to the loo. It fits in your pocket. You can read it kind of almost anywhere. And, and all Tristan attempts to do in that book is um, let you begin to understand why what you're looking at in the natural environment looks that way and once you begin to do that um and i you know i read the book i don't know six seven eight years ago and i must have given away 25 or 30 copies of it um everything you look at you begin to understand everything better in the natural environment and, and understand why it's there and the you know back to the um david attenborough quote of people won't i'm paraphrasing but people won't um look after something they don't understand and they won't understand something they haven't experienced and um in addition to a couple of other books you know i think it'd be really great if 
um, there perhaps was a Kickstarter to get a copy of How to Connect with Nature into a kind of as many schools and things as we could. It's really, really easy to read, and it, there's just there's so many, oh, wow, I get it now, moments in the book. And then when you're driving up and down the motorway or you're in a plane or you're walking or this, that and the other and you understand, um, you know, landscape and environment and human impact on it and everything else. And it's not it's not preaching anything. It's just a, it, it's, it's like um, looking at a work of art on a museum wall and then the curator or the, you know, museum staff coming along and, and just gently beginning to explain the picture to you until until it kind of makes sense. And that's... Um, it's a great book, and I think I genuinely, honestly think it's an important book as well. Okay, cool. That's a good suggestion. It, um, it doesn't help me because I've read it, but in terms of people <laughs> listening to this, I think it's a really good choice because it is a, as you say, a gateway into more things. Um, okay, next question. There's a, there's a barefooted backpacker going past as well across the cobbles, which is um, navigating by his phone. But there we go. Wonder how long he'll remain barefoot in the. Um, urban streets of Sheffield. What do you want to be when you grow up? There's a brilliant um, photo which I stick on Instagram every now and again, isn't there? Of a, I don't know where it is. I think it's one. Of, it's a sign outside a shop or something that I saw that says, um, don't grow up, it's a trap, <laughs> which, um, which is really good. Um, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? Um, I, I guess the most important thing is healthy. Um, in, in, uh, there's a a tenement of, of um, Buddhist teaching and Buddhist psychology learning. I'm not a Buddhist, but something I can really, that really chimes with me is that, you know, the, the, um, the importance of looking after yourself more so than, than anything else in your world because the healthiest, most stable, most happy, most engaging um, person you are you're then able to kind of radiate that in your offerings to the rest of your family, friends, relationships, colleagues, and everything else. Um, so, so, so it's not actually selfish, then. It's uh, it's, it's not selfish in in any way at all. And, uh, yeah, and if, you know if you you know your your relationship with partner, wife, husband, school friends, everything else is is detracted from if you haven't worked at making yourself the best self that you can be. So I think, um, what do I want to be when I grow up? Uh, first and foremost, healthy. Uh, secondly, is still still active, um, you know, active in open spaces and wild spaces. The ability to um, to still get to them and to you know to walk in them and climb in them and have the bunch of kind of um, friends and colleagues and and um, and opportunities. Um, I, I think also on occasion when the weather's really really rubbish is kind of sat by the fire in one of the classic mountain pubs of Great Britain with my son, so it'll be another four years yet, um, but with my son having a having a beer with him and, um, yeah, just, just kind of doing that thing that I think dads look forward to where they can kind of have a chat with their, chat with their own lad down the pub and, and uh, have, have a couple of beers with him. I was, um, I was in the Clackagin in uh, Glencoe two days ago and um, I just had that kind of thing in my head of, I really want to be here with my son when he's old. Clack is one of the really famous mountain pubs of Britain. I want to be here. And the old Dungeon Gill, perhaps also in um, in Langdale, is one of them. Um, uh, yeah. Nice. Yeah, thanks. That's a very good answer. Next one. Are we doing all? As no, no, we're not doing them all. Oh, we'll right. do them till I get bored of you, which is <laughs> um, which is which is approaching. What is enough? Crikey. This sounds like a good final question, That's, isn't it? What is yeah. enough? Links back, I think, to the previous question of whether it's. Although I don't think you can have enough health, um, but certainly, you know, it, it, it's um, it's a sufficient amount of those things that are important in your life to you know, bring you health and happiness. I don't think, uh, but you can use wealth. I'm not a great believer in kind of in excesses of wealth, to be honest with you. That might sound a bit odd, but um, yeah, just uh, just having enough of those things that you need to to bring you happiness and to allow you to either um, live the life that you want to live or, or to be able to kind of um, move towards doing that. I think a lot of the problems um, in the world at the moment are um, have come about by excess, haven't they? Um, be that, you know, be that pollution, be that wealth, be that a whole variety of isms that are that are um, destabilizing society and the planet. And I think um, 
just enough, I think, is um, just enough is enough. Yeah, brilliant. Well, I think that's a very nice note to end on. Um, thank you very much for sharing your wisdom, as always. Thank you for lending me a warm top. Uh, <laughs> and uh, thank you for my coffee and tea. You're welcome. You stuck that on in the... Um, the sun's coming up. absolutely blazing exactly. hot Exactly. Well, some, I put a picture of my bike... Um, up when I first got it, and someone, oh, it's Gordon, the guy we yeah. and had a curry in the cave with. He saw the picture of my bike and he said, Please put a mud guard on your bike just to guarantee us all a nice dry summer. So <laughs> <laughs> I've put this warm top on so the sun will now shine. So thank you very much. Brilliant. Cheers, Al. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Living Adventurously. There's show notes from every episode on my website, alistairhumphreys.com slash podcast. If you have enjoyed it, please take a screenshot of your phone and pop it up on social media or leave a review with your podcast provider. It makes a massive difference. Thank you very much. I teamed up with Kamut to make this podcast happen. In case you missed it, Kamut is an outdoor planning and navigation app that helps you explore more of the great outdoors. One of the many ways Kamut helps you have better adventures is through their inspiring collections. Are you exploring a new area and not sure where to begin? Type in where you want to go and local collections will suggest a number of cycling or hiking tours based on the most scenic routes. It's a great way to get started exploring in a new place, particularly if you don't know where to begin. Wherever you find yourself, your very own outdoor experiences are waiting for you. Go explore more with Kamut. Head to kamut.com slash chi and use the voucher code ADVENTUROUS to claim your free region bundle.